destroyer escorts, cheaper and faster to build, filled the bill of necessity, and they did it well. Horse trading in Boston, Copeland secured certain mechanical improvements, a pair of gyro repeaters for the bridge wing foremost among them. With the new compasses, his quartermasters and watch officers would be able to take more accurate bearings. To help turn his mostly teenage crew into a team ready to fight a desperate and savage enemy, Copeland brought aboard key non-commissioned officers and technical specialists through the Navy's personnel lottery. As the Samuel B. Roberts left Boston Harbour and broke into the wide waters off Cape Cod, Captain Copeland set course for Norfolk, and Provincetown was coming into view on the starboard bow. E.N.'s John Leclerc, the officer of the deck and his captain seated in his bridge chair, scanned the morning sea and listened to the slow cadence of the sonar system's echo-ranging machine as it sent its sharp falsetto calls into the deep in search of enemy submarines. Suddenly Copeland noticed that the outbound ping was getting a hard echo in return. Before I could fully believe my ears, the sonar operator called out, Good contact, 400 yards up Doppler, referring to the acoustic signature a bogey made while closing with the ship. Copeland thought to himself, barely out of port, and a submarine is already stalking us. Recognising the possibility of collision, Copeland leaped from his chair and grabbed the engine order telegraph to ring a stop bell. Before the skipper could send down the order, there came a deep, hollow-toned boom and a reverberating crash that shook the ship. It felt as if a torpedo had hit. Copeland rang a back full order to the engine room, but the impact continued to grind along. A few seconds later, a second violent seaquake shook the ship. I was below decks when there was a great shock, then a grinding sensation along the keel, and finally the stern shook violently, Chief Yeoman Gene Wallace recalled. I rushed to the deck, and there on the sea was evidence that the Roberts had made her first kill. There was blood on the water, and bits of flesh positive evidence of a kill of a whale. The Roberts's first underwater kill was a magnificent sixty-foot-long specimen, whose backbone had been severed by the ship's slender bow. The stricken animal spouted a geyser of blood as the officers and crew raced topside, ran to the rail and looked aghast. The whale's immense bulk rolled alongside the starboard side of the ship as a growing blood slick stained the water. The destroyer escort's churning starboard screw soared at the whale, cutting clean through its backbone again. The crew watched transfixed as the ruined beast surfaced behind the ship. No captain ever wants to report that he has run his ship aground, certainly no captain with hopes for a bigger command. But what other conclusion should be drawn from the dented bow? the bent keel and the broken screw. Captains customarily made up stories to cover for their negligence. It is legendary in the Navy, Bob Copeland later wrote, that unless she sticks fast, no ship admittedly runs aground, all groundings being laid to collisions with submerged logs and the like. But this was no phony sea story, and Copeland didn't want a stench of suspicion hanging around him or his ship. The exec, Lieutenant Bob Roberts, took a fix on the ship's position, documenting its location well clear of shallow waters where a grounding could take place. Meanwhile, Captain Copeland, ever the lawyer, ordered his crew to gather up the exonerating physical evidence. Several chunks of whale hide and flesh were recovered from the ship's hull and preserved in medicinal alcohol by Dr Irwin, the division medical officer. Copeland continued on to Norfolk to have the broken propeller repaired in dry dock, no question ever arose as to the origins of Samuel B. Roberts's inaugural bruising. It was an incident that grew in comic magnitude as time went by, but just as surely could it be said that the Sammy B.'s voyage to the Philippine Sea had begun with a very poor omen. Such dramatics and the small vessel had yet to enter a combat zone. While their ship was convalescing in Norfolk, Lieutenant Roberts and Captain Copeland made final adjustments to the crew roster, weeding out a few ne'er-do-wells from the ship's complement of 219. Among the 217 keepers, Copeland could sense a coming together that boded well for the upcoming journey to the Pacific. The skipper gave his crew leave and instructed them to report back to the ship in time for its departure a few days later. Bud Comet, a 19-year-old seaman, took the opportunity to visit his family in their coal-mining settlement on the Guyandot River in northern West Virginia, where they lived in a home owned by the coal company. 
So long as Mr. Comet showed up reliably at the mine and obeyed his superiors and called his boss Mr., he would have a place to live and get the hours he needed to bring home a living wage to his family. Mostly he fed his family out of his vegetable garden after he gave the best produce to neighbours. My dad figured there were people there poorer than us. He gave the best stuff to them, and we got what was left. If he killed a hog, he gave most of the hog away, Comet said. When the visit was over and Bud was due to rejoin Samuel B. Roberts, he saw his father off to work, then left to catch the train to Norfolk. He found a seat aboard the train and looked up to see a familiar face sitting across from him. I want to talk to you, his father said. Bud knew that the foreman at the coal mine didn't grant time off lightly. From the look in his father's eye, he could see that what his father was about to say was likely going to be important. Mr. Comet was concerned about his son's future. It was 1944, the world was at war. He told the teenager he was worried that he would get out to the front and be overwhelmed or afraid and wouldn't do his job. If he screwed up and went over the hill, and if the MPs had to track him down and haul him to the brig, he would bring upon his family the worst of sins, dishonour. If there was one thing he needed to avoid, his dad said, it was dishonouring his mother. He reminded his son of his own beginnings. Born in Italy, the senior comet was raised under the worst of political systems. He had come to this country and managed to make a living and provide for his family. What this meant, he said, was that America was worth dying for. Death would be acceptable, so long as it was honourable. An honourable man dies once, he told Bud. A coward dies a thousand times. Comet thought he had heard that line somewhere before, maybe from Shakespeare. His father didn't mention anything about the bard. Bud Comet was pretty sure his father had never read Shakespeare, he said. I think he got that out of his heart. But Bud Comet's heart was already spoken for. He had fallen hard in love. The object of his affection was Samuel B. Roberts. I had confidence in the ship. I had confidence in the people who I had met on the ship. I had confidence in the officers who I saw on that ship. Mr. Roberts, our executive officer, was Annapolis, very strict, strictly Navy. I felt that he would be stricter than anybody else. There was Stevenson and Moylan. I had a lot of respect for them. Comet grew to like Dudley Moylan, the ship's junior officer, with an English degree from Duke and a 90-day wonder commission from Notre Dame's officer candidate programme, was prone to spontaneous kindness. On late watches, once in a while, Ensign Moylan would bring by a pot of coffee and some cups, toss them around, fill them, and sit down in the gun tub with the men and visit and just talk, one man to the next. Junior officers could be that way. John Leclerc was like that too. There was an unshakable goodness to him, with his blonde hair and easy, boyish smile. He had a natural empathy for even the greenest sailor, Leclerc and Moylan were the only officers with the group that made the five-day train journey from Norfolk to Houston. Enlisted men who talked with Johnny Leclerc weren't put off by his gold bars. He didn't put up any of the barriers that other officers did. I remember Leclerc, Bud Comet said. He looked at you always and smiled like he was in love with the ship too and the people that he was serving with and was very proud. Somehow Samuel B. Roberts just seemed to foster that kind of pride. It tended to trickle down from the top, of course. Anybody caught up in the fantasy that the Samuel B. Roberts was the good ship lollipop always had Bob Roberts to reckon with. He could be arch and domineering, but in that sense his personality meshed well with the job description for an executive officer. He was remote even from his own officers. Enlisted men lived in another universe altogether. Like Lloyd Garnett, he was a Mustang, an officer who had entered the Navy as an enlisted man and performed well enough to win a field appointment to Annapolis. Coming out of high school in Ridgefield, Connecticut, he had been beaten to his Congressional District's Naval Academy appointment by an ambitious Yale University sophomore. So he made his Navy career the old-fashioned way. He jumped into the enlisted ranks with both feet and within two years won entrance to Annapolis by taking competitive examinations at sea. He and Copeland were among the few experienced officers on the Samuel B. Roberts. Most of the others were so-called 90-day wonders. There was no small amount of sarcasm behind the title, for veteran petty officers seldom acquiesced to the authority of the young men who swaggered aboard as newly minted ensigns in the Naval Reserve. In theory, a 90-day wonder was superior even to the senior-most chief, but if a young officer planned to have a long and thriving career in the naval service, 
he was wise to defer to his chief's experience. At the top of the chain of command of enlisted men, the warrants, the chiefs and the first-class petty officers were the ones who had the experience to get things done at sea, from tying lines to launching boats to bringing on stores to organising work parties. On the Roberts, Red Harrington, the first-class boatswain's mate, was the catalyst for most of what the deck force accomplished. The radio department relied on the leadership of Tullio Serafini, a grizzled but popular chief whose naval service dated back to World War I. Chiefs did not wear golden barred epaulettes or cap brims laden with braided scrambled eggs. They did not dine with fine silver in the officer's ward. But they were capable men who had spent their best years at sea, by virtue of seniority, a forty- or fifty-year-old warrant officer, whose half-inch gold stripe gave him the actual privileges of an ensign, earned more money than many an admiral. In his two years as an enlisted man, Bob Roberts had painted enough bulkheads and tugged enough lines to acquire a certain saltiness to his personality. But as the only Annapolis graduate aboard the ship class of 1940, he comforted himself with the assured professionalism that only Bancroft Hall and Tecumseh Square could breed. His blend of experience and pedigree made him a respected leader. Beyond those emotional nuances, the exec's job was intellectually demanding as well. To handle the considerable responsibility of supervising the Combat Information Centre, the executive officer of a destroyer or destroyer escort had to have a quick mind. During a torpedo run it fell to him to perform the exact work of selecting the ship's course to put it in optimum position to fire its torpedoes. A computer was available to help with the mathematical chores, but computers, even simple durable mechanical analogue devices like the first-generation Mark I fire control computer, could fail. In those cases, the human mind had to step into the void and determine the target's speed and course, his own best firing course, the torpedo's optimum speed, and all the difficult geometry that that work involved. Bob Roberts's mind was among the best, Copeland called him as fast as a slide rule and as accurate as a micrometer. An A1 crackerjack boy, as sharp as a phonograph needle. Bob Roberts probably looked at a young officer like John Leclerc, so full of niceness and interpersonal engagement, and saw a greenhorn who needed a little toughening. The exec knew how to focus impressionable minds by hitting them where they were strong. Once he pulled Leclerc aside and told him he didn't like his attitude toward the Navy, and thought he didn't take enough interest in his men. Leclerc rated himself highly on both counts and seethed at the remark for weeks. Later, he exacted an underling's brand of revenge. When he was scheduled to take the ship's whaleboat to retrieve the punctilious exec from Liberty, Leclerc found a defensible reason to be three and a half hours late. He and his buddy, the junior most officer on the ship, Dudley Moylan, got a laugh out of the passive insurrection but Leclerc was dead serious about avenging his honour as a friend of the crew. As long as I have the confidence and trust of the enlisted men, Johnny wrote his mother, Mr Roberts can go to blazes. In Norfolk, Lloyd Garnett pulled some strings, or just as likely, picked some locks and requisitioned for the crew its very own ice cream maker. The luxury of carrying such a machine typically belonged to aircraft carriers and other larger ships, Usually, escort vessels contended for the privilege of rescuing a downed pilot, knowing that their reward in exchange would be five gallons of the frozen treat. Now Roberts could tend to its own needs in the realm of iced confectionery. Before leaving Norfolk, Bob Copeland decided to add one last recruit to the ship's complement. How the dog first came aboard had less to do with the captain's preferences than with the drunken enterprise of some Roberts sailors on shore leave. The small black mutt was found on the dock, smuggled aboard, and hidden someplace where officers seldom went. Before too long, in a fit of candour, one of the sailors went to Captain Copeland and asked permission to keep the dog on the ship. Copeland and Gurnett took the dog into the wardroom, sat down over coffee and cigarettes, and decided that greater expertise than theirs was required if the dog was to be made a crew member in good standing. It was well after midnight, but they summoned Dr Irwin, the sleep-ruffled physician arrived as ordered, standing on the cold floor of the wardroom in slippers, a skivvy shirt and cotton khaki trousers. As the doctor rubbed his eyes, Copeland said, We have a new recruit on board, 
and I want you to give him a physical and make out a health record for him so that we can properly take him up in the ship's company. Irwin stared at him. Had he really been called at 3 a.m. to perform a routine physical exam on a new crew member? Gurnett brought Irwin some coffee. Come on, doctor, sit down, he said. The physician looked around for his patient. Copeland gestured beneath the large table. Irvin looked down at his feet, saw the puppy, and erupted in anger. He told the captain what he thought of his and the first lieutenant's little joke. On the verge of stomping off to his bunk, he was stopped in his tracks when Copeland said, Oh, this dog is going to be the ship's mascot, and everything has to be just so. Grudgingly, the doctor pulled out his stethoscope and got to work. His skipper was impressed. He really gave the puppy a thorough going over. He took the stethoscope and checked the dog's heart and lungs, and he got the blood pressure thing out and wrapped him up. I don't think he had any more idea how to take a dog's blood pressure than I did. He made out a complete medical report on the puppy. He put on a good show for just the two of us, Gurnett and me. Then he sent for the chief yeoman. I think he was as put out as Dr. Irwin had been at being broken out of his bunk. However, he entered into the spirit of it too, and made up a service record for the puppy. We forthwith named the mascot Sammy. Given the rating seaman second class, Sammy received a rapid promotion to petty officer during a tour of the boiler room, initiated by an obliging fireman who found him peering down a hatch toward the Black Gang's wonderland. The noise of the boilers threw the animal into a fit. As he relieved himself onto the hot steel deck, he earned his rating of water tender first class. A sailor adept at tailoring, Sam Blue, took a Kapok life jacket and with a few cuts and stitches, fashioned a miniature life jacket for the dog. Sammy made a splash. Speculation flew in the gizmo, the ship newsletter, that he had a canine paramour in Tokyo and saw the DE-413 as his quickest way across the Pacific. The teenagers and young men aboard the Samuel B. Roberts acquired a certain degree of affection for the mammals that touched their lives, both the one they had accidentally killed and the one they now saved. With their official mascot now on board, the boys joined by their dog, the ship's journey to the Pacific was delayed no further. From Pearl Harbor, transferred from the 3rd to the 7th Fleet, the Samuel B. Roberts escorted convoys to the naval base at Enivatok, a huge coral atoll whose massive lagoon, a circular landscape of coral heads filled with white sand and bright blue water, was cut through with sleek grey warships. The Roberts made the Oahu to Enivatok run twice before continuing south with a convoy toward Manus at two degrees south latitude in the Admiralty Islands, where part of the Philippines' invasion force was gathering. Getting there required that the Roberts cross the equator, an event that is of some significance in Navy tradition. When a ship crosses the equator, it is common for one with a significant complement of newcomers to hold a crossing-the-line ceremony. Apart from usual divisions of rating and rank, men aboard warships fall into two classifications. So-called shellbacks have crossed the equator before, polywogs have not. The distinction is treated as important enough to push aside the meritocracy of rank that separates the men. A polywog lieutenant is still merely a polywog, and a shellback seaman a shellback. On a ship full of reservists and new recruits like the Roberts, the polywogs vastly outnumbered the shellbacks. Bob Roberts was the senior shellback. Only two other officers, Lieutenant Herbert W. Bill Trowbridge and Lieutenant Lloyd Gurnett, had crossed the equator before. They were joined by 25 or 30 enlisted initiates of the Charmed Circle, as Bob Copeland called them. The rest of the officers and crew, nearly 200 men, were polywogs, Lieutenant Commander Robert Witcher Copeland among them. Their initiation was as much theatre as ceremony and as much hazing ritual as theatre. In preparation, the shellbacks broke out old swabs, manila line, canvas and bunting from the ship's stores, and fashioned costumes for King Neptune and his royal family to wear. The screen commander's signalman, a man named Price, played Davy Jones, Neptune's messenger. Bill Trowbridge, garb a long-tailed coat, a silk top hat, a golden wig and a big white moustache, was the royal judge. To Copeland, he looked like a country circuit judge of Abe Lincoln's time, a carpenter's mate, Dari Schaefer, painted and powdered. Until he actually looked pretty delicious was Neptune's wife, dolled up in hula skirt and a brassiere. The royal dentist was there, and the royal barber too, but the best of show prize went to Tullio Serafini, the old chief radioman, 
all 240 pounds of him, made an ideal royal baby. He showed up wearing a big diaper fashioned from a mattress cover or a large sack and held with a big safety pin. Aside from that, he didn't wear a stitch. The initiation began when Davy Jones, dressed in a pirate suit made from black bunting, declared that the ship was about to enter the domain of Neptunus Rex and demanded that all shellbacks ensure that the pollywogs pay their due respects. Copeland had his yeoman pass a special order that all crewmen were to wear their undress whites and officers to wear their dress whites. It began with minor indignities. An officer who was particularly unpopular with the crew was forced in the highest heat of the equatorial day to sit on the steel deck over the sound hut above the pilot house and don a complete suit of foul weather clothing, which included multiple layers suitable for the Arctic and a rubberized top coat. Over it, they strapped a Kapok life jacket and perched a sou'wester hat on his head. As the officer baked from within, he stayed topside as ordered for an hour and a half, keeping the watch with a large pair of binoculars. Pollywog Copeland was sent forward to stand by the jackstaff and keep a lookout on the horizon, using a portable foghorn as a long glass. He played along gamely, calling to the bridge a steady stream of lookout reports, seahorses drawing carriages, and all manner of other fanciful trappings of Neptune's realm. After the shellbacks lingered over steaks and a rich variety of side dishes, while the pollywogs watched and waited, the pollywogs were given beans, bread, water and coffee. Then the initiates were ordered to hear the charges against them. The less memorable or colourful crewmen were accused of being a pollywog. Most, however, had additional charges to defend. When Bob Copeland's turn came, I found myself charged by King Neptune with the most heinous of crimes. I had killed a whale, a protected whale of all things, served in Neptune's royal hunting grounds for Neptune's exclusive sport and game. On the face of it I was guilty, the whale was certainly dead, my ship had killed it, and of course as everyone knows the captain is responsible for what the ship does, good or bad. It appeared that I was as guilty as Robin Hood for invading Sherwood Forest and shooting the bloody king's deer. Around 8pm all hands were ordered to stand down for the night. The following morning the initiation resumed. The crews aboard the five other ships in the convoy's screen were holding their own crossing the line ceremonies. To ensure that at least a few of the ships had a full watch at any given time, this was, after all, wartime and Japanese submarines were about the ships started their ceremonies 30 minutes apart. On the Roberts, the Pollywogs were ordered to the fantail, stripped down to their shorts, and faced prosecution for their offences. Fire hoses were turned on them all. Warships had firefighting gear that would make most municipalities proud. Bob Copeland was duly soaked. Then the Royal Devil, wielding a pitchfork whose copper tines were wired to a high-voltage, low-amp electricity source, stuck him a few times, delivering a bracing jolt. Ushered before the King, charged by Lieutenant Trowbridge, the Royal Judge, Copeland produced the soaked piece of paper containing a poem he had written in his defence. His alibi went in part, I hit the whale, that much is true, but I pray, my lord, what could I do? My ship was on a mission bound when the royal whale chose to sound. My ship, it never had a chance. Your whale came rushing like a lance, straight up at us from depths below. We were attacked by an unseen foe. The whale we hit, death was his fate. But not in malice, rage or hate, no other course was left to me. So self-defence is now my plea. After considering the plea, the court handed down a verdict requiring the skipper to visit the royal dentist and the royal barber, kiss the royal baby, then run the royal gauntlet. By the time the captain, now a shellback, returned to his cabin to clean up, he had had his hair smeared with fuel oil paste and his mouth washed by a valve sprayer filled with diesel oil, vinegar, paprika and other imponderable ingredients. He had planted a kiss on royal baby Serafini's grease-loaded navel and he had run the gauntlet, crawling through a 15-foot canvas ventilation tunnel filled with a two-day-old compost of eggshells, coffee grounds, potato peels and other unmentionables, while shellbacks pounded him through the canvas with large wooden paddles. Copeland cleaned up as best he could, then returned to the fantail in time to see the four mess stewards, Washington, First, Butler and Lillard, the only black men on the ship get theirs. Those messmen were good fellows, and they took the initiation in stride, 
If I ever had any race prejudice in me, the war knocked it out of me. The system of segregation that kept the black sailors in the mess could not withstand the bonding effects of the crossing the line ceremony. The only thing worse than participating in the ceremony was sitting it out. Watching his shipmates run the gauntlet, one crewman became squeamish and asked to quit. Lieutenant Roberts didn't miss a beat. We'll dismiss him. He's out of it indeed. The ceremony was purely voluntary. This sailor was free to go, about two hours later, once it sank in that he was now the only pollywog aboard the ship, he returned and begged to be given the works. According to Copeland, I suppose we were mean, but we wouldn't let him have it, he had had his chance and he flubbed the dub. I still can't help but feel sorry for the poor boy, I know what he missed, he really missed the feeling of something you can't put into words, a feeling of belonging. There was no more practical preparation for war than the fraternal coming together of the young men who gave the Samuel B. Roberts life. At Manus, the ship itself found new associations too. On October 12, after Bob Copeland and the other skippers had been briefed on the planning for Operation King Musketeer I, as the Philippines invasion was known, the destroyer escort joined her cousins in the 7th Fleet. The old battleships of Admiral Oldendorf's Task Group 77.2 the escort carriers of Task Group 77.4, and most of the other tin cans that would join her under the call sign Taffy 3 for the long journey to Leyte. The three destroyers of Taffy 3, the Hoel, the Heerman and the Johnston, were the only ships in the 7th Fleet Task Unit that were not conceived as lesser versions of a more capable vessel. Escort carriers were bargain basement aircraft carriers, Destroyer escorts did the work of destroyers with less than half the main weaponry and one-third less speed. But the trio of Fletcher-class tin cans were deep-sea thoroughbreds, members of the finest class of United States destroyers produced during World War I. Tin cans, destroyers wore the nickname proudly, for none better suited these ships whose three-eighths-inch steel decks creaked and bent in wave troughs, but rode out storms like corks. The destroyer's forerunners were the torpedo boats that had shown their offensive value as early as the Civil War. Their successes spurred United States naval planners to carry their design forward as the industrialising nation mobilised to defend the far reaches of the hemisphere as required by the Monroe Doctrine. Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt championed the construction of torpedo boat destroyers, seaworthy enough to sail with the ocean-going battle line and protect it from an enemy's torpedo boats. In the years leading up to World War I, as the Navy experimented within the strict zero-sum environment bounded by the variables of size, speed, offensive power, survivability and cost, the modern concept of the destroyer evolved. By 1944, the Fletcher-class destroyers that rode with Taffy III represented the state of the art, they were the first class of United States warship to be designed free of treaty limitations. Because their design coincided with the massive ramp-up in production during the early years of the war, more Fletchers were produced than any other class of combatant vessel. From the February 1942 launching of the Nicholas at Bath Ironworks in Maine, to the June 1944 launching of the Rooks at Seattle, Tacoma, 175 Fletcher-class destroyers would be built by the time World War I ended. Most of them served in the Pacific because the absence of treaty restraint enabled the Navy's general board to tailor the new destroyers to their mission. Rather than to the requirements of diplomats, the Fletchers were large ships. Overstretching a football field at 376.5 feet in length, they were far more imposing than the nickname tin cans might have suggested. It would have taken Ted Williams's best swing to hit a baseball from a Fletcher's fantail all the way to its graceful bow. With a displacement of 2,050 tonnes, 2,700 with a full fuel load, they were swift, seaworthy and stout, with considerable firepower. Though rated at a top speed of 36 knots, the Fletchers carried enough weaponry to make the biggest enemy feel their punch. 10. Mark 15 torpedoes five single-mounted 5-inch or 38 caliber guns, a formidable thicket of 20 and 40 mm machine guns, two roller racks of depth charges, and the sophisticated sensing equipment to land them on their targets. That ships so swift could span the distance from home plate in Fenway Park to the Green Monster in deep left-centre field 
was impressive testament to the power of the Navy's industry and technology. Yet in the taxonomy of United States warships of the 1940s, destroyers were mere dust mites compared with the new battleships named for states and roaming the seas on behalf of their federal union. Individual warships draw much of their personality from two sources, their mission and the personalities of their most prominent officers and chiefs, with destroyers, a certain tension existed between their mission and their mindset. Their mission had long been defined by the Navy's expectation that any war against Japan would involve refighting World War I's Battle of Jutland, heavy ships trading salvos at long range, destroyers standing faithfully by the battle line, interposing screening as needed to protect the higher-value ships. The destroyer's offensive value was largely an afterthought. Destroyer commanders tended to have a more expansive view of their combat potential. Recognising the power of their principal armament torpedoes to turn the tide of a battle, they chafed at their role as auxiliaries. But even as the Japanese were ravaging American fleets in the Solomon Islands with torpedoes and aggressive tactical doctrine that made their destroyers giant killers, and even as carrier aircraft were proving decisive at Midway and elsewhere, American tacticians insisted on the supremacy of the heavy gun and refused to free destroyers to operate in an offensive role. As the war proceeded, the big ships won followings back home with front-page headlines and photos, but the less glamorous grunt work performed by the destroyers helped make their larger cousins' iconic status possible. They worked the outer perimeter of their task forces, pinging the deep for submarines and watching the skies for planes. Tin cans may have been the moniker that stuck to them, but a Hearman sailor appreciated their true nature, the hunting dogs of the fleet. Their vigilant work allowed their more regal principles to maintain the illusion of invulnerability, though battleship guns were often decisive wherever they engaged, as often as not the bigger ships asserted themselves by their mere presence. Destroyers and destroyer escorts asserted themselves with their weapons, or did not assert themselves at all. If battleships and carriers were corporations, with payrolls of thousands managed by a bevy of mid-level managers who wore the gold stripes of lieutenants and lieutenant commanders, destroyers and destroyer escorts were mum-and-pop shops, where the capital ships carried themselves with a certain institutional hubris that existed apart from the men who ran them, the destroyers and destroyer escorts were steel-plated extensions of their most prominent individual officers and chiefs. In this respect, the standard persona of a fleet destroyer was made unique by the shaping and moulding of human hands. Bob Copeland shaped the identity of the Samuel B. Roberts, but in that respect, among the skippers of Taffy Three's screen, he was not unique. The leader of the seven ships that screened the six escort carriers of Taffy Three was the USS Howell. Commissioned on July 29, 1943, at the Bethlehem Steel Shipyard in San Francisco, the Howell had the luxury of two competent popular skippers. The current boss, Commander Leon Kintberger, and the former captain in whose shadow he worked. His predecessor, Commander William Dow Thomas, who stayed aboard as Taffy Three's screen commander. Barrel-chested and good-humoured, Thomas had been a popular captain, his popularity and knack for command earned him the just deserts of the skipper who does his job a bit too well. He got promoted straight out of it. Newly promoted and awaiting reassignment, he was not able to get off the hull before the Leyte operation began. So he chose to remain aboard his old ship as commander of Taffy Three's seven-ship screen. He could be found in the wardroom every night, playing cribbage over coffee. Kintberger, cheerful and pleasant, handled the inevitable benign pressure of Thomas's continued presence with aplomb and grace. Alfred Thayer Mahan had written of the Nelson Touch, a personal style of command favouring cordial social relations with officers, professional appreciation and confidence. The Nelson Touch was rarely the result of careful calculation, but bespeaks rather the inner graciousness of the heart that Nelson abundantly possessed. The Hull's wardroom seemed to operate by Nelson's principle, not every ship was so fortunate. Commander Amos T. Hathaway, age 30, had once been the whole's executive officer. As exec, he was effectively the ship's general manager, Commander Thomas's right hand in all matters. He imposed discipline, he maintained the good order of the crew, the upkeep of equipment, set the daily schedule, 
and oversaw its fulfilment by the senior petty officers. As boss of the Combat Information Centre, he was the ship's eyes and ears, but the way he interpreted and acted upon the things he saw and heard was seldom to the liking of the whole's crew. Hathaway was a martinet, as disliked by his men as Thomas was admired, as martinets are wont to do, he disposed of his duties with an exacting severity. That trait served him well, for executive officers seldom advance by gaining the affections of underlings. Shortly before the whole joined Taffy Three, Hathaway got a promotion and command of his own ship. The men of the whole who had the closest acquaintance with his predations and mind games quietly cheered his departure. But that departure took him only as far as the other side of the formation, when Amos T. Hathaway took command of the Hearman, one destroyer's relief became another one's pain. As the new skipper of the Hearman, Hathaway made his mark quickly enough. The day before he was to inspect his crew at full muster, he asked his chief yeoman and captain's talker, Harold Whitney, to bring him the service records of the full crew. He spent the night with the records and the next day demonstrated the power of his photographic memory by walking down the ranks, stopping at every fifth or sixth man and asking about his wife, family and hometown, by name and with nary a mistake. Though he stood six foot four, he weighed around 130 pounds, with sunken cheeks, protruding ears and eyes that naturally bugged, he was wiry not only in physical bearing but in voice and attitude too. He was reflexively peevish and relished keeping his officers off balance and on their guard. His memory made him a marvellous stickler for rocks and shoals, as the Navy regulations, articles for the government of the Navy were known. He would reject written reports without comment. This is wrong, fix it. But he was just as likely to upbraid someone for slavishly following the rules when they didn't suit him. The patrician collegiality that marked many Navy wardrooms was altogether missing from the Hearman. The native Coloradoan's shrill voice could often be heard chastising someone over one or another point of order. He was a son of a bitch, said a former Hearman officer 56 years after the fact. He made Captain Quig look like a sissy. That officer wasn't alone in his ill sentiments. The Hearman's physician, Dr. Edwin Bebb, was required to keep a monthly medical record on each of the ship's officers. Though he knew he was shielded by his medical credentials, Bebb feared his skipper would resent his adverse assessment of his psychology and seek a pretext to court-martial him. When Hathaway had been the whole's exec, his underlings could take refuge in the kindness of their skipper, William Thomas. But on the Hearman, where he stood atop the chain of command, Hathaway's will was law, and officers who flouted it by coddling persecuted crew members risked drawing his fury. The Hearman's wardroom buzzed with half-cocked fantasies about doing the skipper in. Something had to be done, the thinking went. This was not His Majesty's Navy circa 1835. This was America. Someone suggested that it might be arranged for Captain Hathaway tragically to lose his footing out on deck during a storm. But regicide was beyond them. Ultimately, they settled on less capital forms of aggression. One day, when Hathaway was gone from his quarters, someone found a way to insert a handful of marbles into the compartment above his sea cabin. Every time the Hearman rolled, and like any destroyer, it rolled often and deeply, the captain was serenaded by the clangorous lullaby of the little spheres rolling across the thin steel plating over his bunk. Such petty conspiracy-mongering bound Hearman's crew together against a common enemy. At least Hathaway served in that role until a real foe could be engaged. Perhaps when the shooting started, the crew would see their skipper's malign will as a weapon in its own right. What force might it have when joined with theirs and turned upon an actual enemy? The whole was run by the popular duo of Kintberger and Thomas, the Hearman by the white-knuckled autocracy of Amos Hathaway. The fighting culture of Taffy Three's third destroyer, the Johnston, was the product of one man's inspired leadership, that of its first and only captain, Commander Ernest E. Evans. When Evans arrived at the Seattle-Tacoma shipyard to oversee the fitting out of the brand new USS Johnston, DD-557, he impressed his crew immediately with the substance of his will. At the ship's commissioning ceremony on Navy Day, October 27, 1943, he informed his raptly attentive audience, This is going to be a fighting ship. I intend to go in harm's way, and anyone who doesn't want to go along had better get off right now. 
as if to underscore the invitation, he added, Now that I have a fighting ship, I will never retreat from an enemy force. Something in the tone of his voice told his listeners that he was deadly serious. Not one of them accepted his offer to leave the ship ahead of whatever trouble he had in store for them. Indeed, he was serious. As an officer aboard the World War I-era four-piper destroyer Alden, Evans had witnessed the disaster of the Battle of the Java Sea in February 1942, in which a Japanese heavy cruiser force made short work of an Allied fleet. Two weeks after the battle, Evans assumed command of the Alden, but he never expunged from his mind the sting of having to flee from the Japanese. In that sense, he came to the Johnston with a cross to bear, Evans had initially pursued military service with the dream of becoming a marine officer, but an appointment to Annapolis escaped him. So in May 1926, at the age of 19, he said farewell to Muskogee, Oklahoma, and enlisted in the Navy. Thirteen months after his enlistment, he won entrance to the Naval Academy class of 1931 via fleet competition. His Annapolis midshipman's moniker, the Chief, would prove to be apt for at least two reasons. First, he was by nature always in charge. Anyone who met him could feel the way his charisma naturally filled a room. Then there was the matter of his proud Cherokee heritage. His ancestry was not overwhelmingly evident in his appearance. The set of his dark-browed gaze, the large chest and the subtle smirk of his lips accented by a neat black moustache made him look like a somewhat stouter incarnation of Clark Gable. It was clear to all who met him that Ernest E. Evans was not a man to trifle with. He bestrode his narrow bridge like a colossus. The fighting spirit of his forebears animated him. Evans appreciated the hidden nature of things, the power of the unseen over the tangible. In matters of discipline, he generally preferred to let the idea of his wrath do the work of the actual thing. He never exploded in anger as Hathaway did. He seldom, if ever, upbraided a subordinate openly for poor performance, but then he seldom smiled either. He expected every man to do his job without any psychological ploys, Lieutenant Ellsworth Welch, Evans's anti-submarine warfare officer, remembered. Evans trusted people to do their work if they failed. He let them he knew instinctively, as they did, that they wouldn't fail him twice. He never quite had to spell out the consequences, the very thought that the skipper might become disappointed was enough. Johnston's gunnery officer, Lieutenant Robert C. Hagen, said, He had great faith in all of us, unbelievably so. I don't recall him saying a mean word to me the whole time. The captain was a true, instinctive fighter. We were on a high-class ship because the captain was high-class. If Ernest Evans was not destined to be a Marine, he would settle, 17 years after his enlistment, for running a warship like one. That meant simply that he would take care of his men. He would also, soon enough, take care of the Marines. In February 1944, during the invasion of the Marshall Islands, the Johnston drew shore bombardment duty to support Marines advancing against stiff enemy opposition on the islands of Kwajalein and Eniwetok. For Evans, it was not just another assignment. Beyond his generalised desire to grapple with an enemy, he had empathy for the mud-slogging grunts moving into the Japanese killing fields ashore. He knew this. He could well have been one of them. The Johnston got in close, sometimes so close as to pierce the veil of distance that usually stood between Navy men and conditions ashore. For many of the crew, it was their first sight of blood. According to Edward Block, a coxswain, a landing craft came alongside young kids who had been wounded on the islands. They were brought to our ship because we were close to the beach and we had a doctor on board to see those young kids lying there all shot up, brought tears to my eyes and I cried. There, but for the grace of God, the crew of the Johnston witnessed more of it during the Marianas campaign, during the bombardment of Guam. Broadside to the beach, pounding the caves in the cliffs above with a full battery of five-inch fire, the Johnston fired so furiously that the guns glowed red Bob Hagen had to take the occasional break just to let the barrels cool. During a lull, Boatswain's mate First Class Bob Hollenbar went below to check on Gun 54's handling room when he encountered a young Marine in the care of the Johnston's medical division. Hollenbar approached the Marine, who held fast to consciousness despite the gruesome fact that he had had an arm shot off, and asked him how he felt. I'm fine, sir. 
The kid told the bosun's mate that he had entered the Marines just nine weeks ago. That kid looked like he was about 14 years old, Hollenbor said. My God, what is this world coming to? I'll never forget the expression on that kid's face. And he still had the presence of mind to look up at me and call me sir. Evans cared about the kids fighting ashore. Time after time he took the Johnston closer to shore than the Navy's bombardment plan specified. When his allotted number of shells were fired into the island, such quantifiable being carefully managed by higher command, he beseeched his superiors for more. Damn it, they need fire support, and we're going to give it to them, he said. Twice during the shelling of Guam, Evans boarded his wooden captain's gig, was lowered into the water, and motored over to the task group's flagship to ask for more ammunition. He got it, we would pull away from our positions near the shore and reload with ammo and then pull back in to resume firing, Fireman Third Class Milt Pale said. At times we were so close to shore that we were actually hit by small arms fire in the first year since her commissioning, through six invasions. The Johnston never suffered a hit worse than that. The full court press gunnery duty placed a lot of pressure on the men directing the shooting. In Bob Horgan, one of the destroyer's senior lieutenants, Evans had the kind of gunnery officer the skipper of a fighting ship had to have. Of the 70 men in his gunnery department, which included not only the men who manned and loaded the guns, but also the fire controlman in the gun director and the radar men in the combat information centre. The crews on the two quintuple torpedo mounts and the ping jockeys on the sonar stack only seven had ever been to sea before coming aboard the Johnston. Hagen had pushed them hard in training teaching them the job by rote and repetition. Training a green deck force, never a small task, was made more difficult still when the man responsible for that job on the Johnston, the chief boatswain's mate, went over the hill the day before the Johnston was scheduled to go to sea. A ship had to have a chief boatswain. If Captain Evans did nothing else to impress his crew, he would still have ensured their eternal gratitude for securing as a replacement chief boatswain's mate Clyde Burnett. Burnett was a child of the fleet, an orphan reared in South Texas by four different families. The Johnston's chief boatswain's mate began his life of service in the Civilian Conservation Corps before enlisting in the Navy more than two years before the Pearl Harbor attack. Burnett had just returned from a tour of duty in the Pacific when Evans found him ashore at a Navy receiving station in San Diego. The captain put the make on him, Bob Hagen said. The guy didn't have a chance, as a superior chief boatswain should be. Burnett was right hand to the captain. Ernest Evans relied on him as a liaison to his enlisted force. In turn, Burnett delegated their supervision and discipline to his capable first-class boatswain's mates. Harry Longacre ran the first division, the hundred-odd sailors who comprised the deck force on the forward half of the ship. His counterpart aft, boss of the second division, was Bob Hollenbaugh, a sharp, no-nonsense Indianan whose father, a machinist's mate in the Dantesque boiler rooms of a World War I-era battleship, had counselled Bob to get a topside rating at all costs. Hollenbohr performed his duties cleanly and professionally, and with not a little relish. On a crew made up mostly of first-time seagoers, his, Longacre's and Burnett's most vital contribution was their experience. Burnett proved to be a popular chief, the boyish 24-year-old with the lantern jaw and quiet manner watched over the kids on the Johnston's deck force like a father. The kids who swabbed and painted and scraped and loaded supplies and took on fuel loved him like one. But forging a crew into a hardened fighting unit mostly required, not love, but discipline and ruthless repetitive drill. In that respect, Evans prized Lieutenant Hagen's tough, stickler's nature. He let his gun boss draw up the general quarters or battle stations assignments and gave him the discretion to call the crew to general quarters most any time he liked. Hagen used that freedom liberally, so much so that the Johnston acquired its own inevitable nickname long before it reached a combat zone, General Quarters Johnny. When the klaxon sounded, the men raced to their guns and searched for targets. For anti-aircraft gunners, there were long nylon target sleeves towed by pilots, very brave pilots, from the nearby air station. Crews on the five-inch mounts fired on sleds pulled behind tugboats, very brave tugboats, at varying ranges on the surface. It took a lot of drill for the crew's proficiency to live up to the precision of their equipment. Each of the Johnston's five-inch gun mounts was engineered with the precision of an outsized Swiss watch. 
The turret assemblies were three stories tall, running deep into the bowels of the ship. Each gun mount sat atop an ammunition handling room, where crew loaded shells onto hydraulic hoists dumbwaiters that whisked the shells upward. Below the handling room was a magazine that fed all the handling rooms. Among the greatest innovations of the 1940s-era Navy were the radar fire control systems, with which all new surface combatants were equipped. Unlike the weapons on the smaller destroyer escorts, the guns of a Fletcher-class destroyer were controlled centrally by its gunnery officer. Seated in the enclosed gun director platform high above the bridge, Hagen operated a two-handled steering mechanism that controlled the aiming of the Johnston's five main gun mounts. When Hagen ordered the gun crews in the mounts to match pointers, the guns came into alignment with the director and the gun captains relinquished control of their mounts to Hagen. At that point, the two men beside him in the gun director, the pointer and trainer teenage, enlisted men named George Himmelwright and James Busby took over. They kept whatever they were shooting at fixed in the crosshairs of their telescopes, one for gauging bearing or direction, the other gauging elevation or distance. In heavy seas, the sight of a destroyer's five director-controlled guns swaying in unison to stay on target as the ship pitched, yawed and rolled could be unsettling. This synchro-gyroscopic wizardry relegated the men manning the guns to auxiliary backups, whose duties went beyond simple loading only if the system broke down. As long as range and target data kept feeding the fire control computer, they had no aiming to do and little discretion to exercise. Gun crews had only to pull rounds off the hydraulic shell hoist and lay them in front of the powder canisters in the sliding breech tray. Their most immediate challenge was to keep their fingers and hands from getting crushed between a heavy shell and the breech mechanism. In another day, eyesight was essential to gunnery. Optical rangefinders were useful to a point, but the critical work of spotting shell splashes and correcting aim belonged to those with the sharpest eyes. By 1944, even in its first generation, American fire control technology was so good that it could make a top performer out of a man who would probably have been unsuited to the job not long before. At age 17, having beaten out 60 applicants in competition for the honour, Bob Hagen arrived at Annapolis as an aspiring plebe only to get sent home that same day for flunking a routine eye exam. He opted for the enlisted route, scraped paint for two years aboard the battleship Texas, then returned to the States to attend junior college and finish his bachelor's degree at the University of Texas. In his second bid for an officer's commission, Hagen attended the Reserve Officer 90-Day Wonder Program at Northwestern University. In September 1941 in Chicago, Bob Hagen at last got his ensign's gold stripe. Hagen saw action almost immediately off Guadalcanal as assistant communications officer and radar officer aboard the destroyer Aaron Ward. In a ferocious nighttime surface engagement against superior Japanese forces in November 1942, he took shrapnel to his left biceps, nearly bled to death from his wounds, and won a silver star for gallantry. Returning to the States to convalesce, he decided that he would rather pursue his career in gunnery than in communications. The gun boss could fire a hundred shots and hit once and he's a hero, he said. In communications, if you screw up in transcribing one letter, all hell breaks loose and you've committed a mortal sin. I said to myself, I'd rather be a hero. Hagen finished gunnery and fire control school in Washington, D.C., learning to use the gyroscopes and servo motors that ensured that imperfect eyesight would not impede his advancement. For certain specialised purposes, the Johnston's Mark 1A fire control computer and Mark 37 radar were better than any pair of spectacles, if rather more expensive to clean. Following her commissioning at Seattle-Tacoma during the Johnston's shakedown cruise off San Diego, Hagen tackled the challenge of training his crew of inexperienced polywogs to operate the sophisticated gunnery system. We were all so green, the gun crews didn't know what they were doing, and I wasn't so sure what I was doing either, he said. In the first days of shakedown when drills were going poorly, Hagen wrote a friend aboard another ship, Stay out of our gun range, anything can happen. He was in Captain Evans's thrall, eager to please his charismatic skipper, but the captain made it plain that Hagen was on his own in bringing his gunners to proficiency. 
This freedom to hang himself with his own hawser was nearly as bad as suffering under an ill-tempered micromanager. The pressure began to get to him. Bob Hogan was a nervous wreck during shakedown. Well-groomed and intense, a compulsive smoker disdainful of repose, Hagen had an intellect as sharp as his personality. Intelligence and initiative were de rigueur for a destroyer officer. On a small ship, the performance of a few key individuals could make or break her. Hagen had little patience for those who struck him as slow or stupid. In drawing up General Quarters station assignments, he distinguished the thinking men from rote operators, installing the latter in the sweaty jobs in the handling rooms and magazines, and the former in sonar, combat information centre and fire control, where human discretion could make a decisive difference. Unlike his captain, Lieutenant Hagen didn't hesitate to dress down an underperformer in front of his shipmates. Aware of their growing resentment, he became cautious among the crew. When possible, he avoided walking the decks alone at night, for fear an embittered sailor might accidentally knock him overboard. But many men were firmly convinced that Bob Hagen, like Clyde Burnett, was one of the best things that could have happened to the Johnston. In six weeks of drill, his programme of training turned the gunnery department into a competent working team. Boatswain's mate First Class Bob Hollenbar was especially sharp. The captain of Gun 54, mounted on the stern of the ship, had the initiative and savoir-faire to lead young enlisted men effectively. Hagen also had confidence in Lieutenant Jack Bechdel, his torpedo officer, and in Julian Owen, a resourceful gunner's mate with a knack for repairing broken machinery. The crews in the five main gun mounts numbered 51, 52, 53, 54 and 55 from bow to stern competed for bragging rights as the ship's fastest gun gang. An average rate of fire for a 5-inch or 38 caliber crew was 15 rounds per minute. Gun 55, the rearward most mount on the ship, got off 84 rounds in one 4-minute firing drill, an average of 21 per minute. With results like that, Hagen dared to begin feeling his oats. Writing again to the same friend he had warned several weeks before to stay clear of his scattershot batteries, the lieutenant discarded all modesty. You may now bring on the Japanese fleet. Before an opposing fleet appeared in his sighting telescope, however, the apprentice gun boss would first have to prove his proficiency in action against enemy shore targets. During the bombardment of Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands, Hagen wielded the hammer that Evans used to support the Marines. There, the strict training regimen and the engineered precision of the radar-controlled gunnery system came together at last. Captain Evans took the ship in close to the beach, dropping anchor to stabilise her as a gun platform on the northern edge of the landing zone, which frogmen from the Navy's underwater demolition teams had marked with navigation lights visible only from the open sea. Hagen was nervous as a cat, gripping his slewing handles with white knuckles as the destroyer closed with enemy shore gunners. They could have machine-gunned us to death, and we were trying to figure out how to defend ourselves, he said. All of a sudden, over the loudspeaker came this song, and the lyrics, A Sleepy Lagoon, Hagen found that well-trained crewmen could bring humour to any situation. Call it the product of confidence, the Johnston's entire chorus of weaponry came to bear on the island. There was the sharp, ear-ringing bark of the five inches, the rhythmic thumping of the twin-mounted 40mm machine guns, and the faster metallic chatter of the single-barreled twenties. Men from a damage control party broke out rifles and made like Davy Crockett from the main deck. Lieutenant Ellsworth Welch took out his 45 calibre pistol, outstretched his arm, and enfiladed the distant enemy with the handgun. From his perch in the gun director, Hagen spied a Japanese officer on the beach waving a sabre, rallying his troops to the fight, and thought, why not? He put the officer in the sights of his slewing device, the fire control computer clicked and whirred and zipped coordinates to the Johnston's five main gun turrets. When Hagen closed the firing key, they all barked as one. The technology lived up to its brutal promise. The five-shell salvo obliterated the man. Mr. Hagen, that was very good shooting, called Captain Evans from the bridge, but in the future try not to waste so much ammunition on one individual. The 13 warships that were gathered under the code name Taffy 3 their crews totalling about 7,200 men, sailed under the command of Rear Admiral Clifton Albert Frederick Sprague. 
He was one of the new generations of naval officers who had made their careers in naval aviation. A graduate of the Annapolis class of 1918, he had been tagged with the nickname Ziggy for the kinetic style of his gait limbs a-gangle, tousled hair swinging fore and aft as he shuffled off to class. Though just five feet nine inches tall, he was sturdily built, a skilled and enthusiastic baseball player, and according to a Naval Academy classmate, clever in nearly every sport. Sprague had heard the call of the sea at an early age from his family's oceanfront cottage in Rockport, Massachusetts, 35 miles up the coast from Boston. There he had spent his childhood summers fishing from the jetties of the picturesque headlands with Buster, his Irish setter, and prowling the rocky shoreline of Sandy Bay with his younger sister, Dora, hunting for crabs to use as bait. His attraction to the ocean became so strong as to be physical. He had to be near the sea. To Cliff Sprague, travelling even a few miles inland was like entering a vast, arid desert, tolerable for short stretches, but leaving him eager to re-immerse himself in the ion-charged salt air. For the newly minted ensigns pouring out of Annapolis, naval aviation offered fresh career paths to be blazed, unprecedented opportunities to learn and to lead. In the year 1919, as Lieutenant Sprague was serving on board the USS Wheeling, the General Board of the Navy declared that fleet aviation must be developed to its fullest extent. The board, a committee of admirals who counselled the Secretary of the Navy, predicted that in future naval battles the advantage will lie with the fleet which wins in the air. Embracing the dangers and uncertainty of the field at a time when its preeminence was anything but assured, Ziggy Sprague and the Pensacola class of 1921 was pioneers. When he finished Pensacola's fledgling aviation programme after nine months of flight training, he joined a small cadre of naval officers who were qualified to fly.